Welcome to our series on research data management. Today's topics are research data and their metadata. So we are talking about mainly the metadata, so what metadata means and um, what metadata occur typically within research data context. We again refer to our fake science example on squirrel research. So within this project, Luisa Lida has built a theoretical model to look at the population dynamics of squirrels and she has compared her theoretical ideas with uh, concrete data gatherings from Frank Forscher in Germany and Rachel Research in Great Britain. When she looks back at this um, project, she remembers that it of course was successful, but um, on the other hand that there have been quite some data management issues. And the main point in regard to this data management was that she didn't um, prescribed the other researchers and how to do their data management, how to do their data um, gathering. And that was really something that, well, caused some problems. Unfortunately, Frank and Rachel gathered the data quite differently. Frank Forcher built on the many projects that he have done before. So for example, he builds up an Excel file for each year where the different sheets represent the different federal states of Germany and you have a row for each month and you have columns then for the number of brown squirrels and the number of black squirrels. So that was in a way his approach. Now Rachel, so she traveled around a lot, so moving from one location to the others, talking to the rangers and from this it became obvious that it might make sense to organize her data on files that are collected for each month and where you have the rows representing the different countries like Scotland, Wales and England where she doesn't use the countries but some country code that has been defined in a separate file. And then she used a notation stating that B was black and R for red-brown. So if you look at these data you obviously see that they are somehow incompatible. So it really took quite some time for Louise to find out and understand the different approaches and to also arrive at the situation where she could merge the two observations into same format in order to compare it to her theoretical model. So for Louise it has become clear that it makes sense to put some more efforts into the data management, into the planning and deciding what and how data should be gathered in the future. So this is kind of a data documentation in the first place. And well, we will look at now at some recommendations that you could follow as well um, when you try to set up scenarios or data management collection scenarios. One idea is to introduce an identifier for each observation that you make. Of course, this is typically something that is auto-generated by the measurement point that you use, but you must think about whether you want to have some things like that and what it can be used for and how it can be used. The next aspect is that you should, for example, if you store the date when some observation has taken place, that you should agree on the format that you use here. For example, you could agree on the format ISO 8601, specific stating how exactly the date together with time is represented here. If you do that, it makes it much easier to aggregate the data because you can merge easily merge the data that has been collected from different places and you, for example, can aggregate it on a monthly level or you can even refer to a particular other information like weather information, for example. The next point is that Luisa was interested in distinguishing the number of um, red-brown versus black squirrels. So, unfortunately, Rachel and Frank have chosen different ways to represent that. So this is really something where you should impose some vocabulary, some controlled vocabulary. Of course, if you have a standard or something that is agreed upon in your community, if you don't have that, then simply ask your people to follow one approach. For example, saying, well, we use B for black and R for red-brown and not B for brown, which then leads to misunderstandings. Another aspect is something that turns up also in the persistent identifier video because if you have your observation points it might make sense to treat them as data on their own. So also giving IDs to them and then recording some 
particular information about them. For example, the exact latitude-longitude information, the geographical location of this observation point, maybe also the hardware, the camera that is working within this observation point in order to detect the color of a squirrel. So this is some kind of the data that um, the people should um, agree on, but more, that's not enough. So they must also talk about um, or ensure that they have the same understanding of the data. So this is where metadata comes into play. Of course, it's in, in the first place, it's something at least like the column heading of these different columns. So having ID, having something a date, location, or color. Um, but typically, this is even far too short. So you must have some place where you have some additional information, where you exactly explain how you generate the IDs, for example, whether these are integer numbers or something else how you record your date, ISO format or not, and um, also the locations you must agree on. If you register your observation points with some central registry, um, then you must agree on this procedure and ensure that all the locations are really registered. And the similar thing for the coloring, that you should use indeed a vocabulary that is defined at least in the community, or if you don't have that, then decide it for your project how you want to, the different things to be named here. And when Luisa looks back at this, she also sees that, well, these observation points that she has used via Rachel and Frank within this project, they also gather the data of the size of the squirrel. So while she was not interested in this data, it would of course make sense to record this data as well, because maybe some other would be interested in exactly this data. And that's exactly what we create here by some follow-up project by Remy Reuse, who wants to look at the evolution of squirrels in entire Europe and is asked to build on the work of Louise. And it, indeed, he's interested, for example, in the size of the squirrels, and that's uh, something. If Louise has not taken care that this information is preserved as well, can be impossible to build on that. This has given you uh, some idea of metadata in a very concrete processing, but also in the reusing scenario. So let's look again at the entire research data lifecycle. During planning, of course, you focus on the key elements that your research is about and what data and metadata you want to select here. So the data gathering is of relevant, but also maybe your theoretical model, how it is planned, how it is described, things like that are something that you already has, have available at the planning level. Also, responsibilities is the kind of a metadata information that Frank Forscher is responsible for Germany and Rachel Research for Great Britain is some kind of a metadata that should be available and documented. The next is the point on production, on data collection and gathering. That's what we looked at in detail with this in this video. So, Typically, you have here something like established vocabularies and any additional context information, like, for example, the table of observation point locations with any additional detail on the observation measurements. So this is really something where you can specify and your approach and define what information needs to be recorded. And this is typically done in order to support the analysis phase, where you, for example, want to put the things together, as we have seen here with Rachel and Frank. And any approach regarding the selection and validation is also some kind of a metadata. So if you want to only look at the data in Eiffel National Park, you must somehow specify how you want to make that selection. You can say, OK, I take the following five observation points, or I specify the geographic re region and derive which of the observation points reside within this geographic region by comparing latitude and longitude information. And you should note down which approach you used in order to look at later at your data and maybe understand why some piece of information is wrong because maybe some data is wrong or something like that. So this is also something that supports provenance. Any aggregation approach is also something that is relevant. For example, Louisa was only interested in the number of squirrels per month, right? So we have now seen that within the data model that we looked at today, we have an ISO 8601 data format. So it's rather clear how you arrive at monthly numbers then. And if you record all this kind of information and how you treat 
the approaches and how you're doing that, you also add to your data quality because you make it possible to understand how the data was derived from one and each other. If you arrive at the level of storage, um, there are some obvious metadata information, for example, the file format. If you don't know the file format of some file, you have really problems in opening it and understanding it. But also, for example, the location and the date of the preservation is relevant because it helps you to find out whether it makes sense to look at some particular data or if it is. doesn't make sense because the point that you are interested in has occurred later, for example. And of course, any additional tooling, for example, that you need in order to correctly interpret the data is something that should be specified because otherwise you can't use the data that you have produced there. Regarding access and reuse, for example, if you publish your data, the DOI is certainly something that is important metadata information. Also the repository where your data is published or the provenance information, for example, who put the data in the repository, where did it come from, how was it derived, all these things are uh, again relevant here. Another point that is very um, important and where we also have a particular video on is that if you have publications and you have data, it makes sense to um, note down how they relate. So what data went into which publications and what publications build on what data. If you have that information easily available, then you can easily answer, for example, requests on earlier data that typically arrive because somebody has read your publication. And of course the licensing is also an important metadata information that you produce when you want to publish for example. As you can see there are a lot of metadata occurring throughout the research data lifecycle. And the question is now of course how to cope with that, what to do. Uh, one recommended good practice is that you make use of a data management plan um, that is something that we well, um, detail out in different videos on a generic idea of a data management plan as well as the particular contents. The core idea that you take here is that um, it's kind of a documentation of your data management, but not only your data management, also your metadata management. And this concerns any phase of the entire research data lifecycle. And typically a data management plan evolves over time, so start simple and in the best case, in the end, you have an entire complete documentation of your data and metadata management within your project and can refer to that document for any question that somebody has, for example, if Remy wants to reuse the data of Louise for his new project. So, in our setup, it has become clear that Louise is really thinking that it's a good idea to put more effort into the data management beforehand in order to have less problems within the project, but also after the project has been ended. Because if you look at the metadata and store metadata, it helps you maintain your research data. It helps to merge them, for example. It helps to find your data again, for example, the different regions that you have looked at. You also understand your research data, for example, looking at the controlled vocabulary. You simply know, okay, R is red-brown, B is black, so that's how it, everything is treated within this project. And there's typically, hopefully, one place where you can look up things like that. So, altogether, it helps you use your research data, but also if you want to hand it over to others, for example, if you publish it or if others ask for your data, then it's much easier for them to reuse your data. So, all the metadata management even though it uh, sounds a little bit abstract, it's really something that provides you with some additional information, some context information that is needed in order to correctly interpret um, and use your data. If you have any more questions on metadata or metadata management, just contact us via the service desk. Thank you.